welcome to Live Your Own Way with me, Lucy Gleason Interiors, chatting homes, life and inspiration with my very special guests. I've been really looking forward to this week's episode with fellow colour lover and homeware brand owner Eva Sinaika. Eva's company creates gorgeous, distinctive luxury textiles, homeware and accessories with a vibrant West African aesthetic. And having run her successful business for 11 years in the UK, she also stocks in five different continents across the world. Hi Eva, it's so good to chat to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Lucy. I'm delighted to be on here. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, So let's start by talking about the last, well, three or four months it is now, isn't it, with the lockdown that we had. How has your company coped and got through that? It's interesting. I don't even know how long it's been. I think since March, um, you know, when lockdown started and everything kicked off, I was sure that my company will fold. I thought like, oh my gosh, it's the end of me. My, all my you know, clients will go. And um, and it was the total opposite. My company has flourished since the beginning of lockdown. I think um, a lot of people invest in their homes, invest, you know, spend time at home. So they invest in their homes. I mean, myself, I've invested a lot of um, you know things into my home to just making sure that everything is absolutely perfect because I'm spending so much time at home. Um, so the company has flourished. It has been really, really good. Um, I have um, opened new avenues for the company. I started a course. I launched a course um, teaching um, aspiring business owners how to you know, set up a creative business. So all in all, I can't complain at all. It's obviously been challenging for everyone, you know, um, you know, not everyone, you know, you know, has has security in their life, especially at these times. But I all in all had a really, really good time during lockdown and the business has been flourishing. And um, you've got children too, haven't you? I do. I have two kids um, and I'm really, really, I uh, thank God they're slightly older, they're 10 and 12. Um, so they, you know, really, really adapted very quickly to the new situations of online learning. Um, that's that's all been going very well. I'm very lucky. I've got my office is on my premises, on my, on my, on my, on my grounds, um, but it's outside of the house. So <laughs> I can go to work in the morning and my kids are locked in and my husband is working in the loft. He's, he's a lawyer, so he's working working from the loft so we're all around each other but not sitting on top of each other so that's been really good kids of course they miss their friends you know like kids do yeah, I think they miss the social aspect and schooling wise is fine and my son has his last school of a day of school today so um there we go into the summer holidays but it doesn't feel like summer holidays used to feel because you know we've been at home for the past three months it's been like a, a sort of six month summer holiday, really, I hasn't know, it? I know, I <laughs> know, actually, because I, I don't know what I mean, you know, we're going away, um, fingers crossed. Um, so, you know, it's nice that we're going to have a, um, a change. I'm seeing a different um, scene, but it doesn't feel like, you know, you're, you're, you've are you're worked until the last day and you're going away because, you know, you haven't seen your friends um, since three months. But you know what? That's life. We all have to get on with it, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the same for everyone, isn't it? And they're they're, they're 10 and 12. Do they ever help you out with your business? They do actually. Um, uh, my, uh, you know, and it's interesting because my son is is really techy and really geeky, whereas my daughter is really creative but also really academic. So they help a lot. They help me with um, is, is, um sample cuttings. If you know interior designers work with us, some of the samples have been cut by my kids, not because I forced them to, because they love it. They absolutely love it. Um, I'm very particular of how the samples are cut. That they all think my kids are. I think they're real real pros by now. They really enjoy that sometimes, but. But I think also when it comes to design, um, uh, they have a really good eye and really good impact. I mean, we're redesigning their rooms and I fully involve them because they, I think, you know, growing up with, with, with around me and, you know, around all the, the things I do, they really have a good eye for design and, you know, have their own particular taste and style and what they want in terms of colors. So that makes me really happy actually to see that I think something kind of rubbed off onto them. So, yeah. yeah. So you, it sounds like you've got a couple of budding designers there. I do, I do. We're going to Greece and I'm um, redoing the house in Greece a little bit. And you know, my daughter just helped me choosing, you know, patterns and, and throws. And I'm doing a lot of kind of soft furnishings. And we got some new furniture and she was like involved in the um, choosing project uh, um, process of all the d- details. And whilst we're there, I said, like, come on, let's do and style it together. And I know she will love that. So, yeah, that's all. It's lovely. <laughs> You'll both always remember that, won't you? I know, I know. It's the same with me. My parents, I mean, I'll probably speak about it later. My parents used to work a lot in the design and creative world, and it, it really has an impact on you. So, you know, hopefully that you know, will be with them for the rest of their lives. 
Yeah. So I'll tell you what, let's start about your journey to where you are now, because we've realised we had a little bit in common, didn't we? That um, Absolutely, yeah. You worked in TV production. I worked in TV production. Yeah, so, um, and that was before you studying fashion journalism. That was before, yeah, exactly. It was after my BA. So I, um, let's just really go back. I grew up in Germany and came here in the late 90s with the aim to become a foreign correspondent, to work as a journalist in, in the correspondence world. I wasn't quite clear in which area I wanted to work, but I knew I wanted to do some correspondence work, work for a German company and be based here in London and travel the world. So I started off with my BA in journalism, um, did the BA and afterwards, I literally like through interning, I landed a job in TV production. So I was a runner in a German correspondence TV production company. And I think I was on one that I was very, very lucky because um, he just got a new executive producer in from Germany. He was, to be honest with you, not very good. Um, and he very quickly, after I think two months, sacked that um, producer and offered me the position because I was in the company. I was doing quite well. So I was um, working for a TV production company and we produced a um, show called Urban Nation, which ran across Germans with Austrian TV. I think also here on certain Sky um, channels, uh, which was a um, kind of travel guide from London Paris, New York, Tokyo, and Berlin, um, covering all trends, lifestyle trends, fashion trends, um, cultural trends from these cities. And I was their London, Paris, and New York correspondent. So I lived here and traveled between London, Paris, and New York um, to cover the latest hip things in music, fashion, you name it. And obviously, it was in my mid-20s back then. It was an absolutely amazing job. Uh, but I think you know, Lucy, how TV production really is. It's really, really hard work. I mean, you work long hours, you work weekends, you, you know, holidays are very, very rare. So I did that for, I think, three years. Okay. And it's not like you say, it's not actually the, the most glamorous job that people maybe perceive it to be, is it? Not at all. I mean, you know how it is. I mean, you know, it was a small indie production company. Yes, we traveled a lot, but, you know, and it was normally myself with a cameraman. And you, know, you have to take equipment abroad and, you know, and the you know, shooting conditions are not always, whether it's like 35 degrees or whether there's like snow, you're out and about, you need to get that shot. And, you, you know, how people are, they can be very temperamental and you have to repeat um, scene by scene <laughs> over and over. And and then you have to come back and edit it straight away because it has to go to, um, you know, the, 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 the um, kind of TV channel or whatever. So it's a tough job. It's an absolute tough job. But I think you can learn a lot. I don't know how it was for you, but I think it really taught me a lot of skills, you know, obviously journalistic skills, but also um, I think kind of production skills where you have to really, you know, think on your feet and be very productive with what you're doing. Yeah, you have to be super organised, don't you? Because especially Obviously. if you're doing like a live show, you can't be late. So Absolutely. And also, I think it, it toughens you up a bit as well. It certainly toughened me up. And um, you just, yeah, it's just, you just get on with it, don't you? There's... Just get on, exactly, exactly. It's not yeah. for the faint hearted. If people think, oh, it's, it's, it's super glamorous, it is not. Um, it's hard work. Um, and I think the hours, I mean, I worked about 60 hours plus a week. It was really, really intense. But, you know, you do it because I loved it and I you know, that's what I wanted to do. But then I really felt after three years, I was like, you know what, I want to really specialize in a subject. I want to have a kind of, you know, field of expertise that, you know, I can operate in. And I also, my heart always lied in print journalism. I really missed print. I, I love magazines. I, I just wanted to go back into print. Um, and then I think two things came together. The company lost its major contract with um, the German um, national TV. And um, so he downsized and that was a good um, step for me to go so I applied to do my MA in fashion journalism and you know got the um, the got in and did um, a one-year master's in fashion journalism at the London College of Fashion which gave me again another you know perspective and I really you know when you study fashion when you like fashion you don't know the depth of fashion but you know in this MA we really learned about the depth of fashion about fashion reporting fashion history you know um you know culture um so it was was a really really good year just to take a step back and go back and study be a student I did that and um after that I got a another correspondent role for Germany's biggest um uh, magazine publisher called Boda Media 
And right. So they, um, yeah, so I basically got their, their position as UK um, fashion and lifestyle editor. And I was there for six years, um, covering London fashion for German L, German InStyle, Amica, German's biggest tabloid called Bunte, Focus, which is a business publication. So I did the whole shebang of fashion reporting for several magazines, and it was an amazing experience. Wow, that really does sound amazing. Do you think that each of these positions has helped you, um, you know, shaped you to where you are now with your business? Absolutely. I think without all of these different experiences, I mean, from every every little bit you do, you take something with you, which kind of feeds into where I am now, definitely. And I think that that really works for every profession for, you know, whether you're in a legal field or whether you're in medical um, and, you, you know, you, I mean, these days, I think it's much more fluid that people don't start in one position and, you know, and, you know, and, and see that through until the end of their, their career or their life, whatever, I mean, however, however you define it. So I think definitely, I think I took the, the good and the bad from all of these positions and um, I think it feeds into what I'm doing right now um, totally so yeah I'm really really grateful and I loved it I loved every stage of um, my journey I think it was um, every every position I held and I'm, I know I'm very lucky that I had always dream jobs but they were all fantastic jobs that I really enjoyed. Yeah absolutely um, and obviously to be honest you you'd have to be good at them you're obviously good at them because you don't last too long in a position do you like we were sort of saying earlier if if you're not pulling your weight so you deserve all the success that you have now thank you yeah I think you have to yeah I think you have to be good and I think I think if you're passionate and love something I think then it makes it automatically easier to excel in it I feel yeah definitely so what was your childhood like your dad was an art historian is that right yeah, so I think that also feeds in my dad. My dad was an art historian um, and my mom was a, I say was, my mom is still, she's retired, but my mom is a pediatrician. Um, so I come from a, from a family, I wouldn't say of entrepreneurs, but my parents both had their own businesses. My mom had a, had her own surgery with 2,000 patients, um, so it was a massive surgery and she ran it um, by herself with obviously her team and my dad was an art historian and you know, we've got this beautiful house in Germany where we still my, my dad's atelier is still in there which is amazing I mean it's 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 incredible like high ceilings and it's I don't know how many square meters it's, it's a big big open plan space um so I grew up around that my dad dragged me everywhere I mean it was the, the 70s in Germany you know I was just like in the back of the car you know after my kindergarten or school was over and you know I went to the churches and the museums and they were working in there and you see that even if you're not passionate about it as a child I think it has a major impact on you and um, right now you know later in life I could definitely feel how that inspired me the way I see color the way I see art the and what it does to me in, in terms of inspiration and um, uh, yeah so I think it had a major impact also my parents you know they took it further every holiday we went somewhere culturally so as a kid it can be sometimes a bit draining I was dreaming of just lying on the beach and doing nothing for two weeks so we did that but there was always something that a castle had to be with it that a museum had to be with it. I remember we went to, to Lanzarote one of our really early trips I was really little I just remember you know all the other kids were lying on the beach and we went from museum to museum and I remember I touched a painting and I think the security guard I think the alarm came off and the security guard <laughs> came and shouted to my parents so that was my reality in hindsight I'm so grateful for it because it gave me a love and appreciation for the aesthetic for the culture for art which you know is is part of you which is part of your DNA Mm. And you combine African fashion with mid-century in your designs, don't you? Is that from your from your childhood, do you think? Yes, it's also my upbringing. I mean, I'm of Nigerian descent. My parents are from Nigeria and I grew up and was born and raised in Germany. And I think, you know, so there was always a very strong influence of the African fashion, African culture, but also, you know, I grew up in, especially where I grew up in the south of Germany, which is a very traditional, beautiful part of Germany I mean it's close to Bavaria not I mean it's a few hours from Munich but literally close to Switzerland and so I think the combination of these I mean I never it never really trickled down until later in life again that that really inspired me so I remember playing with with I had, had this beautiful doll's house as a little kid and um 
you know, had my friends over and they were all playing, you know, God knows mommy and daddy and family, etc. And I was just, you know, like staging the house. I was using little scraps of like African fabric and making little bed sheets. I could sew a little bit. I mean, even in, um, you know, in, in primary school, I could do like basic sewing, um, et cetera. And I put, um, I went to my mom's surgery and took the um, cotton pads and stuffed them in there for bedding. So I was always, I always brought elements of, you know, kind of the African designs into the interior space. So I think now that is that is basically me. I think the combination of these culturally is then also now reflected in my work. Oh yeah. It's funny you say that actually because I used to do the same. I had a doll's house and I used to make like little um blinds for the windows, the duvets and even like the wallpaper and stuff. So I guess we we probably knew where we were going maybe earlier than we realized. I think so, yeah, but when you're little you don't you don't kind of realize that, but then I think later in in life it just comes back, you know, I just kind of at some point it just all you know kind of makes sense and you know where everything is coming from. So yeah. But you started out, um, it's about 11, 11 years ago now, isn't it? It's 11 years ago, yes. It's, it's approximately 11 years ago, yeah. It's a little bit longer than I had my son. Um, it's when I was pregnant with my son. That's when I had the idea and then the next 12 years, almost 13 years ago, my goodness. So, um, yes, when and not when I was pregnant, when I had him. So, yeah, that's when I really quickly pulled it all together. And you started by making cushions for friends, is that right? I started with making cushions for myself. So I, oh. um, you know, I was on maternity leave and I am a very busy person. I like to be busy. So I was on maternity leave and I didn't have any plans. So I had the baby and I had a six month maternity leave. And I thought like, what am I going to do with my time? I've got six months and I'm not a, um, how do you call that? I don't even know how it's called, like a mom's group person. I did one mother's group and I was like, you know, it's absolutely lovely. That's not for me. I just need to do something. So I started off with um, putting a collection of cush- cushions together for, for our then apartment. And once they were ready and I can't sew very well. I mean, they're, 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 I mean, just basic. I mean, they were not, you know, ready to put to market, but once this, once they were ready, they looked amazing. And I thought, um, you know what, this is, this is a business idea. Let me look into that. Um, and it, back then I used, um, African fabric. So I didn't use uh, the Dutch wax fabric, which is like, is it African or not? No one. It's a big debate. So I used the Dutch wax fabrics, the, um, which is, you know, considered what Africa's, one of Africa's key fabrics. And, um, is that made of cotton? It's made of cotton, exactly. It's a, a very colourful, bright cotton fabric with a batik texture. So I thought, hmm, you know, it looked really nice. And, you know, I slept a few nights over it and I thought, this is a great, this is a great business idea. Then friends came and family came, obviously after I had the baby, they thought like, oh my God, that looks amazing. Can I have some? So I made a few for friends and it really went very quickly from there. I saw a gap in the market, especially in as I was working in fashion and also in, I mean, there was also L Decoration Germany, which I looked after. Um, and I didn't see anything like that on the market, a African high end, I wouldn't call it luxury, but a premium African brand, um, or African aesthetic brand, um, that caters for the interior design market. So I, I think I moved very, very quickly. I saw that gap in the market. Um, I found a manufacturer in East London who I put a little collection together, just a little collection of, you know, um, sourced some more fabrics, I think collection of maybe 30, 40 pieces. And um, just to have it, um, as I was there, an uh, agent came in, she said, oh my God, that looks amazing. Let me introduce you to some buyers. They took me on and introduced me to buyers. And I think within a season, Selfridges, Liberty and Fennec bought it. So it's incredible, isn't it? I have to say, you know, to, uh, to at that early stage. to have that incredible. In- I yeah. couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my goodness. And that then kind of verified that there is definitely a, um, yeah, a, a, a gap in the market and the business that I could build on behind it. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I have to be absolutely honest, you know, but I didn't have any idea of anything of how to run a business. I was a journalist in the end. I didn't have an idea of how to run a business. And um, I think over the years you learn all of that. So I went back to my to my um, fashion job and, you know, thought like, okay, you know, I have a little side hustle, run it, uh, run it you know, alongside what I'm doing. And um it grew and grew and grew. And I was still in my job, had another baby. And then I had a nine month maternity leave. I deliberately then made it a little bit longer to see what I can do with um, the um, company in the nine months. And I think that it became crystal clear to me that this is my 
path that I want to focus fully on my business. So I went back after I had my daughter for, I think, a year or so. I'm not even sure. I think it was less than a year, six or eight months, and then decided to focus fully on the business. So now where you are with your design and your printing process, how does that work? Do you, um, well, tell, tell us all about it. So so what about, because in the beginning, I started off still with the um, African fabrics that I bought in, but I re- realized very quickly that I had to, um, you know, in order to be unique, stand out, you know, otherwise people could copy me easily. I had to design my own fabrics. And I have a very good friend of mine who's a fashion designer. She started off like me. She comes from a marketing background. She she had a, fas- a passion for fashion, started her own business, and she just started designing her own fabrics. I was like, oh my gosh, how do you do that? She's like, it's, it's, you just paint if you have something near. And I always had ideas in my head. I always painted. I always drew patterns, which I wanted to put on the designs but you know I couldn't find them so I draw everything by hand with pencil and black and white so right. um, all my um, designs are hand drawn and then um, we read it into photoshop obviously manipulate the colors and then um, you know kind of create repeat prints and print it it sounds as simple as it is it obviously requires a lot of thought process of developing co- collections and colors etc but in 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 the end that's what it comes down to so everything is hand drawn and um then kind of um copied into photoshop and then developed from there and how do you choose your color palettes do you have a do you have a go-to color palette so that's an interesting question i saw that um when you know when you sent me the email i um don't work with color palettes but what i do is really interesting because I think before I even design a collection I put a color palette together for me all my designs start with the color so I would you know my Aburi collection was my first collection before I knew what the collection or the, the actual designs would look like I knew what the colors would look like and um because for me I think my kind of motto and ethos is bringing color to life and the color I think comes even before the African aesthetic for my design. So it's a really, really integral part of what I'm doing. So I um, obviously have all the Pantone colors in my, in my, in my office and different ones. So I, and I use swatches, I use, insp- I see, you know, you see inspiration everywhere. I've got a Pinterest board with colors. I, you know, take so many pictures in many in nature. Um, I go to B and Q and, you know, take a lot of, paint some sample swatches i mean they know me already they've got you here again raining <laughs> out of paint <laughs> of paints because so i i start everything starts with colors i've got a big kind of magnetic board in my studio and you know we put the colors out there and once i'm happy with the colors and everything is right then i think about the collection but, i mean other people may work differently and as i'm self-taught maybe that's not the kind of official way to work but for me um the the color is the essence of my designs and it takes i think it takes the longest to get the colors right because whatever you see in the Pantone paint palette you know and everything I put if you print it on paper it may come out slightly different and then we reprint and we reprint and we reprint so sometimes I swatch the colors first and then I put them on designs and then you know on the designs then you know I need to tweak them again so it takes a long time to get the colors right yeah and how far ahead because obviously you will do collections but how far ahead do you have to design for it to be ready for the next season you know there's another thing i think interiors works a little bit different to fashion so i came from a fashion background and in fashion you have obviously two seasons two main seasons a year spring summer and autumn winter and when i started i thought like oh my god i need to come up with two collections each year and um i've been running since 20 it's 11 years so you can imagine i would have to have 22 collections by now and interiors that's not that, that's not how it works so um you come out with the collection and you can change the colors you can adjust the colors you can you know come out with neutral collections so for me if i design i and i think it's due to the fact that i am a very very small business with just two i mean myself and one full-time employee um and we have to run a bit. I have to run the business basically. So if I would, if I could just design, I could design more. But I think it takes me about eight months to finish a collection. Wow. Um, but I really take my time. I really, really. I mean, the new. I mean, right now we were supposed to have launched our recent collection, but due to COVID, I have to postpone it until September. This time, I'm also getting some elements part of the collection, um, which I sourced in Nigeria. I'm expanding a little bit. So you know, these things all come into place. And um, I have an agent in um, New York, an amazing agent, and she said to me, it was very, very, it's like, oh my gosh, I need to come up with a new collection. I need to have some new stuff. She's like, you know what, Eva, stop designing. 
you've got so much. I've got, I think, over 40 designs. You like stop designing more stuff. Just, you know, what you have, work on colors, you know, go deeper. So I think that was really, really important for me to digest because, you know, you can come up with new stuff and more stuff all the time. But sometimes I think it's important to use and utilize what you have and and, and dig deeper and make it um, clearer to people. So that's what we're working at the moment. But a new collection is coming in autumn, um, something entirely different, um, but I'm really excited about it. So, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you actually about, you mentioned an agent in, in New York. Because I think you cover like five continents now, don't you, with your yes, brand? Yes, so how, how do you do all of that? Um, it's relatively straightforward. So I, um, you know, a few years ago, I thought like I really want to expand to the US. And I think my first trade show, which I did in 2012, was actually in New York. It was um, ICFF, which is a trade show in New York. I did that and it was amazing. I got into great stores, made good contacts. But I realized... You know, if you're based in the UK and you want to do business in the US and Australia, in, in Asia, you, you name it, it's really, really difficult to get a foot into the door and for people to see you regularly because, you know, you know, you're physically not there. So um, the amazing agents I saw and I found all my agents on Instagram. I have to say Instagram has been really, really amazing for the distribution of my brand. Um, so they have showrooms um, in major cities. I've got one in New York, one in Austin, one in um, Atlanta and in Toronto, um, in, in Miami. So it's, it's growing, but they basically um, have samples of my um, fabrics and work mainly with interior designers for trade only and represent me out there. So that's how it works. If they, um, they basically represent me on the ground and um, then place order through us. So that's, it's a very kind of straightforward business model. With your, some of your patterns, I, I, I mean, I just love your patterns and your colors. I think Thank they're you. stunning. Um, one in particular, I found really interesting that you'd combined like urban planning in a tropical setting. So yes. which of, which comes first, the pattern or the color? The color comes first. The, the color always comes first. I mean, so for me, it's the, the 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 rule of thumb for myself: the color comes first, and then I can work. But obviously, you have something in the back of your mind. When I started the Fallow collection, which is inspired by an area in Lagos, which is my hometown, where my, where my family um, originates from, um, there's an area called Fallow. It's not the it's it's a yeah it's it's a residential, but also you know quite um uh you know lots of businesses, um a lot of architecture there was built um in the early 50s so the the mid-century and it's 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 called a specific architecture um in, in in african countries but also i think in some asian countries was called tropical modernism and right. it's a very I, I i love it a lot of people who reside in nigeria or live there constantly don't see the beauty of it i think i have to like, i spoke to my husband about it. he's like what do you like about this stuff it's just it just look like run down old buildings but i really see the beauty in this architecture is absolutely stunning so um that really inspired me so whenever i am there i take pictures of buildings of fences of um you know everything and um that really speaks to me but the, the color comes first, but then, you know, there's, it's, it's, um, I specifically chosen some kind of more muted colors for this collection because it's not, it's nothing bright and, and, and vibrant. So I came up with, first of all, it was a very muted color palette, but then, um, I developed it in another season. I thought like, you know, let me just go totally bright and use some, you know, like kind of almost Miami inspired pinks and yellows and turquoises. And I used them in the same collection and worked as well. So, um, yeah, but the color normally comes first for me. And then I kind of adapted to the story that I want to tell with the collection. And also your rugs are really beautiful. Um, they're like pieces of art uh, when you when you study them. Did you create them with the, with in mind them potentially being wall hung? Because you could, as much as you could have them on, on the floor, they could go on the walls, couldn't they? Absolutely. I really believe so. I actually... Um, didn't um, design them with the mind of them being wall hung. But as soon as I got them and got them here and was shooting them, I was like, oh my gosh, they have to be wall hung because they're almost too precious to be on the floor. So I have to say, when I looked at them, I was like, oh, wow, I've, that would just look amazing. You yeah. Know, in a 
bedroom. Bedroom. Yeah. So I am. Um, so and when I do trade shows, I normally hang them on the walls. So lots of people come and say like, "Oh, are they tapestry pieces for walls, or are they actually rugs?" So you can use them as both. I, I mean, they're handmade in Nepal, and I'm working with um, in collaboration with rug maker, and then again in collaboration with Good Weave, who um, kind of guarantee child free labor and ethical production. So they are high end pieces. So I always feel like, mm, you know, I personally like them on walls as 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 um, wall pieces, but it's up to the individual. I have a lot of clients who use them as 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 their as their rugs and you know cherish mm. them on the floor. Do you ever get asked to use um, to make bespoke pieces for people's homes or businesses? Yes, we do. I mean, on the rugs we do, we offer bespoke service in any case because, you know, everybody has a different um, kind of size and colors they want for their living room or for their spaces. So we use, um, this, uh, we, 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 we do bespoke orders on that, but also for um, furnishing sometimes. People say like, oh, we really love your fabric, but, you know, we would like to have it on a, on a sofa. We would like to have something. So we have a bespoke service um, included as well. I actually have to um, kind of expand that a little bit more this autumn because I think we get, I think people are, becoming more individual and want to have more pieces which suit their own individual needs, especially after lockdown. So I need to, I think, communicate that very clearly with the audience that we offer that um, service. Yeah. Um, now, I've been looking at your beautiful Instagram feed and um, a lot of your uh, posts recently have been really very sort of interesting about diversity and, you know, the issues that people of colour sort of face in the industry, yeah. the industry that you work in. Do you feel like the last few weeks has been a shift for the good? I think so. I think it's a very, very, um, I mean, first of all, I think it's really, really sad that it had to come to a point where someone had to die such a terrible death that I think there was like an and I say global kind of outrage about the situation because it has been going on for, for years, for decades. Um, I'm in a very, how shall I say that, privileged position that I can do what I love doing and that I have across the board. I mean, I've got the agents in the US, Australia, everywhere, everyone um, I'm working with has cherished it and has um, absolutely supported it. So, you know, from my point of view, I, I, I have been always in a good position, but not everybody has been there. So I think the last few weeks, definitely shown a light on um, the the talent that is out there, the amazing people that, who are out there um, and who have maybe not have had a voice um, or have not had a, have not been heard, I think. So I think that's a really, really important thing that happened. And I think also what happened here, I mean, a lot of amazing initiatives have been set up in a very, very short time to bring up um, the, the the issue and and make changes. So I really feel that changes. Um, um, Alexandra Dodley and um Sophie Ashby have set up um diversity in design, which is a new initiative which basically um show highlights the issue and finds ways of you know getting more diversity in the design industry. The other amazing initiatives that are going on. So I think it's a it's a start. I think it's going to be a very very long term um process of people almost um you know like looking into their own structure into their own you know businesses and into their own kind of choosing um process i'm seeing where they can make a difference but i hope that it's a step um it's one step at a time but i think it's definitely things happened here and, and also in the u.s i mean the u.s is really big um there are um different design initiatives as a black um and artists and designers guild who are doing amazing work in the u.s for specifically black um designers and um they have a voice and i think people here have a voice and i think think that ch changing well, i think it's a collaborative pro um, process i think um we all have to work on that together in order to make a difference yeah well that's that's kind of what i was going to ask you what we need to do or you know everybody needs to do but i think you've kind of answered that really and um thank you for that yeah no no thank you for raising that i think it's an important issue especially at this um time now it certainly is, yeah, and it's long term, isn't it? It's a long, it's a long term thing, and it's, it's for everyone. It's not just, it's, 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 you know, I think it's everyone who wants a foot in the door. And I, as they, um, you know, I'm as an employer, I employ, um, staff. I um, obviously get a lot of um applications from people specifically of um ethnic minority background, but may, mainly black, um, African or Caribbean background. And often these girls come and they are so talented, but they don't, um, they say, you know, if I go to like a mainstream design from they would not, not even look at my CV due to the fact that I don't think I fit their you know like kind of um, parameters but I think in the end of the day I 
always went for what I wanted. And, you know, I, I had these jobs because I think sometimes if you're, you know, you sometimes have to just step out there and do it. And I say to the girls, sometimes you just have to go and do it. But I think, so I have a lot of responsibility of, you know, when they come and work with me, um, not to, you know, not to see them as an employee and, you know, get out of them, what I need to get out of them, but also prepare them for, you know, you know, what comes after me and, and almost mentor and, um, and nurture them and, and see how great, show, show them how great they are so that they really believe it. So you think mentoring is possibly a good way forward? Absolutely. I mean, I think mentoring is really, really important. And I think that, I mean, it goes, it goes on different levels. I think mentoring is definitely a great um, way of, um, especially now, I think. I mean, I think this lockdown has really showed us so much. And I think a lot of people are working more on their self-development. And I feel mentoring is part of self-development where you can help people to see their potential and, you know, just help them a little bit. Sometimes it's just a few, um, you know, it takes, a, it doesn't take that long, but I sometimes you just have to speak to someone and show them how they can do it and show them, tell them that they're able to do it and they will do it. Great. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I want to ask you about your own home because um, yes. <laughs> I was saying a few weeks ago to somebody that um, I'm, as an interior designer, I always kind of, if I haven't been to someone's house, I kind of imagine what their house would be like. And with someone who creates beautiful, you know, textiles and homeware. I imagine your house to be very colourful, but it's not always the case, is it, with designers? They don't always have the same in the in the home that they create. So, what's what's your house like? Yeah, I think uh, I think I do. I think people come to my house and they say, like, "Oh my gosh, your house is you." I mean, for me, my house is another thing. I um I love my house. My house is my. I mean, I mean, I love spending time in my house. I love every room in my house. I've got obviously favourite rooms, um, and my house is a clear reflection of who I am. Sorry to my husband who <laughs> lives here with me and often is my children who um, I think he's not very fussed about it. I'm really lucky because I really put my little stamp on everything but you know he's he's in a legal world if I have any legal issues he's he's, he's in charge so when it comes to the house it's that I am very, very, very much in charge obviously of how it looks like. Um, I think my heritage is clearly reflected in the house. It's the um, West African, and my husband is of West African heritage as well and born and schooled here in the UK. So I think there are definitely parallels. Um, our, our West African heritage is definitely reflected in the house, but I think also the mid-century um, German upbringing, you know, that I, uh, you know, grew up around. We have uh, some really beautiful antique pieces from Germany in the house and combine them with, um, and I'm really fussy when it comes to African art or African statues. I um, There's a lot of kind of new modern stuff on the market but I have some really old pieces that have been um, handed down from from generations from my and my husband's family some old antique African statues and um, we you know we have some we collect some art pieces I think it's reflected I have quite a lot of color in the house but I mainly use color through soft furnishings curtains my cushions obviously poofs etc artwork um and I when I was a journalist it's years ago I interviewed Kelly Hoppen once um and I was um, fortunate enough to come to her um, home back then in Battersea which obviously is a totally different design style to how I design it's very kind of black and white and taupe but she said like one thing is she's like either white walls and jet black floors is mm. like, it's and it's an amazing thing that I I that really stuck with me. So when we bought the house, I don't know, twelve years ago, um, and we extended it, we have like a kind of a sunken living area, etc. So I have um a stained uh, not myself, but I got the bills to stain um our wooden floors in the black, and I absolutely love it. It's just like it gives the room a different dimension, and then we use color a lot in, in soft furnishings and arts, artwork and all the art pieces we have. So yeah, and every room has its own story because my kids have their influence on in their rooms, you know, they have, you know, they, they, they are, you know, kind of, I speak to them, but I think I also use uh, some of the elements that I think fit into the overall theme of the house in their, in their rooms. So yeah, I love the space. It's a, it's a, it's, and it's a nice thing to have, to have a home where you can be yourself. We entertain a lot. And I mean, obviously not now, but um, pre-lockdown, we entertain a lot. We have a lot of guests over and it's a really, really happy space. Yeah. So it's also been our havens, hasn't it? Absolutely. So if you, if you have people, which I'm sure you do coming to you saying, um, I'm, you know, I want to put some color into my house, but I don't know where to start. Yes. Where do you go with them with on that? 
I have that a lot. And I think they come to me specifically as they know that we have the soft furnishing. So I think if you start with something, you know, and just to go back on that a little bit, people often are afraid of using color in their home because they don't know where to start. Um, they think it's overwhelming and then they go with the safe, you know, taupe gray white black which you know can look really really beautiful but i think especially in a country like the uk you know where you know we have long winters and you know you don't have a lot of sunshine normally and also the way the houses are built i think you need to have a little bit of color in there just to give you that happiness so i would recommend starting with um with soft furnishings how i did it in my house um start with a few cushions um for example you know um just to start and see how you feel about it and i think once you caught the bug, you can then go further. I mean, look at your artwork and then, you know, I think you need to make sure it works. It, first of all, look at your own personality and what color represents you. Some people love blues, um, you know, other people as this um, um, lady I recently followed on Instagram. I think it's something blue, um, home, she, her whole house is blue and um, it looks absolutely amazing. It wouldn't be for me because I'm not a blue person, but, you know, looking at the house, it looks just totally beautifully curated and then you have to see what you have on the walls you know have you got a beautiful painting and can you get a cushion that matches the colors or the, the feel it doesn't have to be like matchy matchy um so i would start with that i think also rugs are a great way of adding color to a home on a on a, the, the first step so i think take it step by step but i think it's definitely important to try it because once you start you can't stop and i'm not talking about having pink or yellow walls and green sofa and you know like lilac um, you know lamp fittings or something like that some people like that yes it's not myself i wouldn't live like that but start subtle um and you can see the impact it will have on your on your overall well-being i think yeah i know what you mean by saying you can't stop because i'm literally always looking for the next thing to paint or change in the house I can't help it and I, I know my family are, well they're long suffering but um, it's just it's a bit addictive actually isn't it it's addictive I know and they're, they're long suffering is the word for it but you know I think they appreciate it I, I really believe I think I'm sure your family is the same I'm sure they appreciate it and they're like oh my gosh you know what they're, that's that's what they're used to and once they you know the kid, uh, you've, you've got kids yourself I've got two, yeah, similar to your ages, actually. Yeah, you see, and I think once they get older, they will, they will, you know, you'll see them setting up their their own homes, and you'll be like, wow, you know, it had an impact. Um, and but I think the long suffering <laughs> will will hopefully kind of change. Now I know you've got a color guide on your website, which is fantastic. I but do. I'm hope I'm hoping you're going to say yes to this uh, question. Is there any chance that you're going to do a book? You know what? Someone told me the other day that I will do a book. Um, you, 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 you caught me there. I think I will do a book at some point. I would love to do a book, but it, it, I, I think I need another three, four years or something like this. But, you know, you just, you know, just planted another seed in me. I think I should do a book, shouldn't I? Oh, you should, you should definitely do it because you've got so much experience in, you know, in so many aspects and just, you know, the whole, your whole journey and uh, about the colors and the design, the whole lot. I think it would just be brilliant so please do okay you know i will do it i will i think i think we just yeah because i i spoke spoke to my mom about it and my mom was like you know maybe she should do a book i was like oh, you know what when how but yes maybe i should i think that would be a good um good way of kind of bringing it all together because i did a book for my ma dissertation which i never published and i really like it i still have it in my studio but i think maybe i have to bring it all together at some point and yeah i will do a book that would be a good aspect of the book, you know, your your um, what you did for your MA. Yeah, that was on contemporary African fashion. So I was I was still in my fashion um, kind of phase then. Um, yeah, but I think right now I've got so much experience. You, know, you you meet amazing people also along the way who are really inspiring. I mean, some of my manufacturers whose stories are incredible. I mean, you know, I've I've, I've just um, I put posted something on Instagram the other day when I spoke to my manufacturer who's been around for forty years. Um, um, making handbags and they're making couture bags for Lulu Guinness. They used to make Anya Hind March bags. I mean, they used to be UK's one of the UK's leading bag manufacturers and they're just two, him and his brother right now in a little garage and it's just all fading. And I just think like, it's so sad. And I really like to tell their story. So yeah, I think it's uh, because you meet amazing people. Um, you know, my, my cushion manufacturer again, whenever I go there, it's like an experience. It's fantastic. And I think bringing this all also into the narrative would be interesting. Yes. So let me digest it and, um, and, and, and take it on board. So this year you're a judge for the Amara Interior Blog Awards, aren't you? So 
um, it, it's very hard. Obviously, there's some amazing, very talented uh, bloggers out there. What are you going to be looking for? You know what? I haven't, um, because you are, you are more an expert than I am because you've done it pr um, previous, um, and, uh, was it last year? You've done it previously, the Amara blog. So as, uh, first, it was an amazing honor to be um, amongst these judges for such a prestigious award. Um, I haven't gotten my category yet. I think they will inform us about that shortly. Um, I'm just looking for something. First of all, someone who has a continuous blog who I think gives us something I wouldn't say something new because it's, it's really difficult to be new, but I think something which kind of enriches you in, in, in your, in your knowledge of design. Um, it could be inspiring. I think sometimes you can have a fantastic blog, which is, um, more, um, picture based, you know, um, as Instagram has gone, you know, really strong. And I think it's like a little, sometimes like a little mini blog when you look through that. But I think something that inspires me, something that is almost a little bit new. I'm looking for great captivating written content so that you know i come i come back with um enriched or with something wow that's that's something which i would adapt or um look into myself so i think that's the um i'm looking at something along these lines obviously continuity is super important because you know you can have the greatest blog if you don't um get out there and blog regularly that's um that's it's it's not good enough so i think that's something i'm looking for but i'm really excited to get my category and get cracking yeah i look forward to that um yeah how was it for you back then did you have a specific category back then or yes yeah, so i was working on, on the crafts and diy category okay. and it was it was really hard because they were all so talented so you do have to literally put blinkers on i think and yeah. that's all you can do um, and also you know the public decide to Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a big help. I think that's a public um, deciding to as a massive help because I think you can only go so far and then, you know, you need to leave it up to, to them to, to make a choice. You're also very kindly, um, you're working with Design Havens for Heroes and you're offering some of your pieces. Yeah. I, I feel, I feel that's the least I can do. I mean, you know what? I, I, don't know what people have been through. I mean, you know, we've all been clapping every Thursday. I'm so sad that's over. I still would love to clap because I think they're still doing a great job. Um, and I think, uh, if, as we all know, so I'm, I'm donating some of the products, but I also um, will style someone's home. I'm not an interior designer, but I can definitely style and decorate someone's home. And I feel that the home throughout this lockdown, my home has been my haven. You know, I came home. That's where I could feel safe and relaxed and where, you know, I could, you know, get some more energy and positive energy from. And I think we should all have that, especially if you're working in a field, if you're working in a field where, you know, you're exposed to something as substantial as, you know, COVID-19. I think it's it's the least I can do. We can all do the least we can do. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I'm going to be doing a, a room too and I've got everything crossed that I can use some of your designs in it. Of, of course you can, <laughs> let me know. And what I feel as well is that, um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, if you imagine you come home after hard days of work and you're in some, you know, you're in a, in a space that doesn't reflect you where you don't feel that, I mean, you know, I, I can't imagine. So I think that it's, it's, it's a great initiative to do that. Well, I'm going to be talking to Francesca uh, next week. Oh, fantastic. So we'll be discussing it more then. Great. I'm going to look out for that. Yes. Yeah. So um, apart from your upcoming book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What, what's happening over the next couple of months? Um, so the new collection will come out. It's obviously been delayed because of COVID. I couldn't shoot it and, you know, I couldn't produce half of it because my um, factory was closed. And also I um, am integrating some um, materials which I handmade in Nigeria for it. So this is coming over in August. So we're going to produce uh, the new collection, which I'm really excited about. Um, I think it, will, it was supposed to launch at Decorex. Um, but I just need to find a new way of launching it. I'll do a virtual launch or, you know, what? I'll, I'll find a new way because Decorex is also going to be virtual, which, you know, it's not um, in the physical form. So the new collection is going to come out. Wallpaper will be added to the line. We're going to add some pottery to the line. So that's that's what comes in terms of product. Um, obviously, the Amara Interior Design Award, I'm really excited about. And then just growing as a brand and as a um, passionate you know, designer to, um, you know, continue to grow the brand and um, get, um, yeah, get more visibility across the world. I think that's what I'm planning to do. Well, I'm very excited about all of that. And thank you so much for talking to me today. I really appreciate it.
absolute pleasure thank you so much for having me on the show and um yeah really excited to listen to all the other great podcasts you're doing oh thank you thank you well i hope you enjoyed our chat today if you'd like to check out eva's website then pop over to evasonica.com and you can keep up to date with her instagram at evasonica and actually me too at lucy gleason interiors next week i'm talking to interior designer francesca rowan plowden who recently founded the charity Design Havens for Heroes that we mentioned a bit earlier, where NHS staff will be receiving makeovers by designers all over the UK. Until then, have a good one. Mm-hmm.